it's time for another episode of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday episode. This is episode 470 of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Congo. And today's January 4th, 2019. And you know, Kevin, today on this day in 1965, T.S. Eliot, a great Anglican poet, literary critic, died. And the man who coined the phrase, men without chests. Yes, that's right. Empty chest. And, and whether he was prescient about the Church of England's bishops or Anglicanism, I don't know. George, welcome back to another program. How's it going? Just great. Fantastic. We're in the process of setting up our new house. As you can see, I've run out of clean clothing and have gone to the back of the closet. My wife says I'm wearing my bowling shirt. It mm -hmm. is not a bowling not shirt. Not a bowling shirt. Well, no, you, you've adopted Kevin's design uh, emporium. I wear my black polo for every episode. Sometimes the, if I feel really drastic, I'll do the blue polo. So there's nothing wrong with polo shirts and, and, and button downs. And if you don't see me ever again, it's because I have to rewire the dryer cord. <laughs> going Because we're in a newer home, we've got to go to a four-prong outlet from a three-prong outlet. So if I electrocute myself, it's just you and Gavin uh, with the olds from time to time. We all know, George, you said if. I think you mean when. You electrocute yourself. When, no, no, I burn myself <laughs> with blow torches and welding, and uh, I, uh, I. Well, we won't go into that. No, that's right. <laughs> You're like the Three Stooges when it comes to home maintenance. George, let's move a little bit on to news. Um, I remember I went to the Orthodox Anglican uh, conference at Neshota House, uh, must be six or seven years ago. And uh, I was setting up my cameras, and one of these young uh, Orthodox seminarians came up to me and says, Why are you Anglican? I, uh, great doctrine run by Keystone Cops. You know, I, I like Anglicanism. It has form, it has function, it has the liturgy. Um, it, it just it sits well with me. He says, well, I would never be Anglican. I wanted to be part of a church that never splits. Yeah, <laughs> pride before the do you know can't step into a oh, whatever and so I'm like pride before the fall, and uh, I, that that moment always sat with me. The, the pride that the seminary had, and some of the pride that I see within the Orthodox Church. The news recently is this all-out war over in Europe going on uh, in Russia and Ukraine uh, between the Orthodox, and they don't play fair. I thought you could uh, let us know some of the news. First, here's the news this morning. First thing I woke up, Ukrainian customs officers have refused to allow the nativity epistles of his holy patriarch Krill of Moscow and all Russia to be brought into the country. Now, that's not customs. Somebody called and said they're not one of us anymore, George. Uh, well, Kevin, in the 17th century, mm -hmm. after the, in, in the centuries following the collapse of Byzantium, orthodoxy was rudderless in the sense that the uh, ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople uh, was under the uh, control of the Turks. Russia was rising, and the Ukraine was sort of moving in a vacuum, partially Catholic, partially Orthodox, partially both simultaneously. And in the 17th century, the ecumenical patriarch gave the control of orthodoxy to Moscow. Mm -hmm. Well, the Soviet era arose and everything was suppressed. And part of the suppression uh, was uh, led to the creation of an orthodox patriarchate based in Kiev. Well, when the Soviet era ended and the churches came out of the catacombs, you had four churches, really. You had the Greek Catholic Church, which were those Ukrainians who were faithful to Rome. You had the Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate, which were the majority uh, because they had the favor of the government at the end of the Soviet era, and they were under the Patriarch in Moscow. Then you had two independent Ukrainian-based Orthodox churches that were not recognized by anybody else. Well, this pet last year, the ecumenical patriarch recognized the autocephalacy, meaning the independence and canonical integrity of the Orthodox U Ukrainian church. The two groups have merged, the leaders have stepped aside, and now 
with Ukraine and Russia at, in a semi-hot, semi-cold war that has spilled over into a war between these two churches. Some clergy are moving from one to the other and the governments of each side are helping and in getting involved and it's just a holy mess politically but in the theological terms there's a major schism because each side is lining up its allies and they're out of communion with each other such that a the moscow patriarchate will not allow its clergy to participate or celebrate services with the clergy of the ecumenical patriarch bartholomew that's schism. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's be, you know that's as big as it gets within the Orthodox Church. Now, that, that Kevin, that's like uh, Drexel Gomez, Archbishop of the West Indies, saying Gene Robinson may no longer celebrate communion when he comes to his winter home in San Bartholomew in the West Indies. Yeah. That's that's where that's, we are. That's where we are at a Robinson level split. Now, Russia, Putin still supports the. Uh, you, the Orthodox Church in Russia. Moscow Patriarchate. Yes, yeah. he does. And in fact, the Russian Orthodox Church is very nationalistic. It sees Russia as having divine mission from God to Christianize the world. And on many levels, it's a wonderful thing. Um, we should not bash the Russians too quickly just because they're Russians. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church has basically declared war on the secular humanism that is uh, so rampant in Europe and is looking to establish Christian morals, Christian doctrines, Christian worldview, and at the same time, they're beating the hell out of the Ukrainian Christians. So it's it's a difficult situation. It is, because I think the uh, Russian Orthodox are also considered guilty by association with the former Soviet Union and with Putin. You know, they, they, they get the, a bad rap there. Well, they do, and part of it's deserved mm -hmm. in the sense that historically they can look, and that there was a whole two or three or four generations of bishops, uh, some of whom, including the former patriarch, were KGB agents. Uh, I, his name just ran out of my head, but the one before Kirill had been an informer for the KGB, mm -hmm. and you couldn't become a bishop in the Russian Orthodox Church unless you had the approval of the state, and you had the approval of the state if you were uh, amenable to its doctrines and teachings. And nonetheless, orthodoxy survived. It was underground for the most part. And when the Russian era, when the uh, Soviet era ended, it began quietly to shed itself of the traitors, collaborators, criminals in its midst. Hmm. But the stink stuck. Yes, it did. It did. Let's do a little transition. Let's talk about a church that is successful and continuing to grow. Um, you know, not perfect, has some undesirable clergy, many desirable clergy, um, and is sticking really well here in North America. And that's the ACNA. And, and the Orthodox churches too, by the way. All of those fit for them. Yes, it is. <laughs> Good point. But let's focus on what we know about. <laughs> that's right. Um, in the pre-show, you mentioned the Gamma Leo test, which basically, if it lasts, it's of God. Um, and uh, uh, it's interesting because we were told the ACNA wouldn't last five years. Uh, all its detractors, even at its formation, people in the in the building when the ACNA was formed, I remember them saying, "This isn't going to last. This is just a you know a little party get together. Um, there's no way without our support or without the mission or the EMEA that uh, the ACNA will ever go anywhere." And you know, every day goes by, every month goes by, every quarter, every year. And the ACNA is here to stay. It's kind of past the uh, Gamma Leo test, George. I'm not surprised, but I'm surprised. Mm -hmm. How's that for an Episcopal answer? I'm oh, God. You're my so mouth. tech, are you? <laughs> I was there with you, Kevin. We were at, at, uh, at uh, it's not Fort Worth, Bedford, Texas. At no, it was Eagle. Plano. We were at Plano. We were at Plano, too, but I'm thinking about the... Uh, the meeting oh, that's right, uh, yeah. where uh, at the cathedral in Bedford, Texas, where the ACNA was formally launched. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. There were people in the building who were supporters saying, this thing's not going to last. We're going to break apart over women clergy. Yeah. We're going to break apart because 
the AMIA can't work with uh, Cana, can't work with the Anglo-Catholics, can't work with the Evangelical Charismatics. It's all going to blow apart. And if history were to be the guide, then they were perfectly right. Yeah. Because what we saw in the continuing church movement, every man a king, every priest a bishop, that hasn't happened. And the ACA, well, let's, let's focus. The ACNA is a thriving, healthy church. Yes, it could use more money. Everybody can these days. Yes, parts of the country are doing much better than others. The South, the Carolinas, Florida, uh, that's prime, that's still Christendom. Mm -hmm. I mean, my Episcopal Church flourishes in that environment. The ACNA flourishes in that environment. Let's go to Canada, where nothing grows. <laughs> <laughs> Not because it's freezing, <laughs> but because it's a very hard environment. It is very hard. Uh, the uh, Anglican Network in Canada had, at its synod last, I believe it was last month or maybe November, mm -hmm. discussed whether it was time to divide into three dioceses. Right now, they're a single entity for the whole of Canada. Divide into a Western Canada and Eastern Canada with roughly four or 5,000 uh, active people each, plus a third, which we'd call an ethnic one, meaning basically catering to the large Chinese, Asian, Anglican uh, Vancouver in that network. Yeah. Vancouver mm -hmm. and Toronto and places like that. Mm -hmm. Well, they decided let's not do it yet because we just don't have the financial resources to afford it. Now, let's compare ANIC to the Anglican Church of Canada. The Anglican Church of Canada has not released statistics for going on 10, 15 years now. We have some individual diocesan statistics. And one of those is early last year, we did a report on the Synod of the Eastern Newfoundland, where the bishop got up and he gave detailed statistics showing that 80% of the Anglicans oh, since the 60s have withdrawn. And part this came in discussions whether it was time to amalgamate the three Newfoundland dioceses back into one. I'm thinking based if I extrapolate that data, ANIC is probably got about 20 to 25% of the average Sunday attendance of the National Anglican Church of Canada. So That's what, amazing. I mean, well, what can we, what can we take away from this? Yeah. With very little resources in a very hostile, secular environment where the law has been just as vicious against them as it has been in the United States, ANIC is thinking about expanding. AC, Anglican Church of Canada, ACC, is talking about it, the inevitable uh, amalgamation. Yeah, you, I, you knock out Toronto uh, with its wealthy uh, inherited money, um, Anglican Church of Canada really is in a free fall. I would say the Anglican Church... They're individual clergy and individual spots, and they're, I don't want to paint it with too broad a brush. But the, the writing's on the wall. Demography is destiny. Who's going to be around in 25, 30 years? Uh, we're talking a decade, George. Who's going to be around in Canada in a decade? Um, if they haven't released their numbers for 10 or 15 years, they are embarrassed by their numbers. Uh, they're relying on money in the savings account um, and other places. And if it's all hidden, that means we're a decade away. This isn't 25 years away. Now, Stand I'm not saying, I, and I'm not saying a decade away from closing. I'm saying a decade away from major changing, major merging, major consolidation uh, to the point where they're supporting 60,000 people, 50,000 people, and not their reported 125,000. Well, let, let's look at the uh, Francophone diocese, Montreal and Quebec. The diocese mm -hmm. of Quebec, uh, which is basically everything but Montreal, mm -hmm. The majority of its parishioners are members of First Nation tribes on the northern Arctic region. The, uh, the Diocese of Quebec, yes, yes, the English-speaking population has moved out of that part of the country, that's true, Correct, yeah. but it's not been replaced by any French-speaking Protestants, or there's no growth whatsoever. So the Quebec, as a diocese, is all but more of it. And Montreal, it's the same way. It's all but more of it. And, and Montreal introduced, uh, was one of the first to come up with gay marriages. Well, as far as I can tell, and I follow this closely, the only gay marriages that the diocese has performed have been between diocese of Montreal clergy. 
there has not been a swell of people to come to the new progressive standard bearer of Anglicanism in Canada, the Diocese of Montreal. It's just not there. And what what will 10 years, five years, the money's going to run out before 10 years, certainly, Kevin. And what we're going to see is we're going to, and here's a funny thing, in the Arctic regions, the indigenous First Nations, the Inuit, uh, the Northern Quebec, they're holding their own. But part of what the Canadian church has basically said was, well, we'll have two moral standards, one for white men and one for the Indian. Well, we can't call them Indians. Because they're Canadians. Indigenous, for indigenous the, people. Indigenous people. Yes. We'll have two moral standards. Homosexuality is a sin for the indigenous people. It's not for the white man. Uh, divorce and remarriage. You said remarriage, white. Remarriage, you said white man. No, no. You said white man. Pale face. Indigenous and pale face. You got to get these also, terms right. And, and also, Kevin, you're right. Pale face is gender neutral because women are pale face too. So we have the pale face and the indigenous people. We have two moral codes, and because of Canada's fixation on white guilt over uh, its treatment of the native peoples and all this and that. There's, it's, friends, sell this stock. Sell stock. Short <laughs> the Anglican Church of Canada. Go out, borrow money, short, this short the stock, stock, and you will make a killing. I, I, I got to tell you, you will make a killing. And, but, and when it's left, they'll have all this real estate in downtown Toronto and Vancouver to liquidate, turn into condominiums. Get your hooks into that because as an ongoing entity, it's over, folks. Well, it's suffered under these latest trade wars we have with China. Um, I've I've seen Vancouver prices taking a dip from a million dollars a square foot to you know five hundred thousand dollars a square foot. Um, that will change. I think uh, uh, China and uh, the U.S. are going to come to a big deal in February, but we'll see what happens there. And at the same time, there are only so many Chinese millionaires, and there are only so much so many places to park your money. Yeah, friends, buy land in Florida. <laughs> it's land cheap. In Florida. <laughs> okay. Vancouver. I mean, come on now. Well, it's still Canada. It's cold. <laughs> Let's, yeah. Well, we've okay. We've teased the frozen Anglicans. We've teased the Orthodox. I want to talk a little bit about the Methodists. We don't talk about them that much on the program. Um, and I have some Methodist in my background as a uh, young Christian uh, before I was a Christian. Um, and uh, they have survived their doctrine wars. They survived their their tech issues up to now because they're at their governing body at their top level. They include the Africans in their decision making. Nothing can happen here in America without the Africans having a say. And there's a large proportion of Methodist Africans who are like Anglican Africans don't want no changes to the doctrine, and um, they've stopped what's been happening in the Methodist Church. However. That can't last forever. And I've always said, and you told me this too, that the Methodists are 10 years behind us. Uh, and when I say us, I meant the Episcopal Church. They're 10 years behind the Episcopal Church. That's not us. I guess I'm ACNA. Uh, but I think in the next two or three years, you're going to see big changes in the doctrine here in America of the Methodist Church, George. Well, I must admit, my sources of information come from the always valuable IRD. Um, mm -hmm. Mark Tooley, Jeff Walton, and the gang there cover the Protestant mainline world in ways that are just phenomenal. They do a great job. And I read their stuff every day. Um, and yes, the Methodists are 10 years behind the Episcopal Church, but they're catching up rapidly. A number of years, I think two years ago, three years ago, they elected a partnered lesbian to be bishop of their Mountain West, which is the Idaho, Utah area. Okay. And lawsuits were brought because she specifically lives a life that is forbidden by their book of order and the clear and the judicial system has been finessing this again and again and again and now the woman has come up with some doctrinal statements that deny the exclusivity of jesus christ that deny the divinity of jesus christ things that jack spong said 25 years ago but this woman is packing it all in simultaneously <laughs> And what's, what we're seeing is that the liberal elites who have been raised up out of American seminaries and who've risen to positions of power within the American Methodist Church are finding that they can't game the system anymore. 
they've been spinning the and through the legal system and through uh, synod votes. They've been trying to, they can't go any farther and the thing is going to break or fall apart. And in some respects, this is, I believe, an excellent thing because we're, we saw this in the Lutherans. We saw this in the Anglican world. We are seeing, we may see this in the Catholic world, but there really is a, I like the analogy that uh, one of my favorite commentators, Scott Adams, who's the uh, author of the Dilbert cartoons, he talks about shaking the box. Whenever a situation comes where all the variables in play and it looks like things are, are stuck, uh, uh, somebody comes along and shakes the box and all the pieces move and you start all over again. With the, me with the coming Methodist implosion, explosion, I implosion. have an opportunity to shake the box for the Protestant mainline world in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we may be closer to corporate reunion with Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and even the Roman Catholics than we've ever been uh, since the Reformation. Oh, easily. Because there are real, as Gavin says, there are two theological churches, the Christian one and the anti-Christian one, uh, and the opportunity to come together, I don't think has ever been greater. Yes. Now that's the United States. Uh, it's not England, it's not Canada, unfortunately, um, but there is opportunity here in the United States for the church to be arise stronger from all of this stuff. Well, and I think what's going to also, I mean, there's obviously going to be a coming persecution uh, more of Christians uh, by the media, by judicial, uh, by the you know government in, in a decade or so that will also draw us closer together as denominations, those who are faithful to the gospel and the teachings of our our church fathers, and uh, I think that will also garner uh, a lot of unity within the church. Early on, well, I, early on, I spoke about Pope Francis being the one uh, pope in a million generations who could finally offer an open table. I don't know if that's going to happen, but you know, with the common persecutions, at least the Protestant Church will be more unified. Being America, we have a unique uh, structure that. I think hinders persecution, and that's called local uh, autonomy, local independence. Mm -hmm. Right now, we see that in places like Portland, Oregon, or in California, where local state authorities refuse to enforce laws on immigration, for instance, passed by the state house or by Washington. So the police just refuse in Portland to arrest the Antifa protesters. They uh, go along to get along. If laws of or persecution came about, I'm equally confident that the sheriff's department in my little county would not enforce them. Simply put, um, why do I know that? Because I've got a lot of sheriff's deputies in my congregation. I know the sheriff. And I know that in America, we don't have a centralized police or criminal authority. Power is very, very localized. So there will be persecution in certain places in the United States. But well, I don't think it'll be universal, and it certainly will be very difficult to enforce if it is universal. Well, I look at like Jack Phillips out in Colorado, the baker who uh, won his Supreme Court case, uh, um, is being persecuted again because uh, somebody else within the county uh, was re a, a transgender person was refused a cake, and uh, he's going right up through the, the Colorado system to persecute this guy. And I think right now it's on an individual, local basis, persecutions. Um, but I see, especially with our public schools um, and our this generation of millennials having really no exposure to religion or Christianity uh, and just being social justice warriors, that there is a time in the future, decades out, where there will be more open uh, persecution of Christians and Christendom. Um, Okay, if it can, I, I hap if it can happen to the Jews, how hard is it to do it to the Christians? I don't doubt, Kevin, that that is the trajectory in which we're going, but can call me uh, silly, but I believe that there's an underlying American ethic that crappy public schools and stupid politicians can't destroy. <laughs> Frontierism, I agree. <laughs> and, and, that, and that is the life and liberty of the individual. Mm -hmm. I And... I think what we're going to see in Colorado eventually is that the judges will be impeached, the legislature will 
change sides. The uh, Civil Rights Commission will be disbanded because that is all within the gift of the people. Now, what needs to happen are that uh, a leader needs to arise to, stab, to attack the elites who are seeking to establish their tyranny over the common man and men and women. We're seeing that in France. We're seeing that even in Sweden. We're seeing that in the UK. Some people say we're seeing that in Donald Trump, but I don't want to get into that particular <laughs> political. <laughs> Let's not do too much politics here. But well, my, my point is my point is that um, the I how should I put this without seeming to be a jackass? I know these people, the elites. I went to school with them. I I was reared in Palm Beach, Florida. I know of where they come. I chose a life dedicated to serving the poor. You don't wind up in Okeechobee either, uh, unless you're a really crappy priest or you choose to be a servant of the Lord. The point is there's such a disconnect between the, uh, the uh, financial services and the bureauc bureaucrats and the common people that uh, if you tell me there's going to be a revolution, I wouldn't die. Hmm. It's that it's that divided. Sure. Well, we shall see. You, you know, for an Episcopal priest, you're very optimistic, and we appreciate that here on the show. You know, <laughs> well, God, Kevin, God has won the battle. <laughs> yes, he does. All we have to do is Satan is defeated. We know the end of the game. We just have to hold on and not despair. Seriously, just hold on. I'm holding on. I am. I, you know. I'll do another show. I got a show in 10 minutes like I do with Gavin. So let's finish up. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 470 of Anglican Unscripted.